Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we have Ali Spittle. Ali, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm absolutely thrilled that you are joining us. I think this is going to be so, so much fun for for a bunch of reasons. I mean, I, I think I'm excited about the subject matter, but I'm also just excited to, to spend some time hanging out with you. I've seen your work all over the place. You are in in so many amazing channels doing so much cool stuff. So uh, I think we're going to have an absolute blast for anyone who's not familiar with your work. Do you want to give us a little rundown of, of all the things that you do? Yeah, for sure. And thank you so much. You do so much as well. So I'm so excited to be here. I've watched this stream before and it's a ton of fun. Um, so a little bit about me. I am a senior developer advocate at Amazon Web Services. I work on the Amplify team. So lots of JavaScript and other front end things in my day job, which is really fun. But outside of that, I also have a blog called We Learn Code. And I co-host a podcast with a couple of my really close friends called the Ladybug Podcast. And I think a lot of the ladybugs have been on here before too. So um, that's kind of about me, but we're going to be talking about React today. And I've been writing React code since before ES6 came out. And so it's changed a lot over the years and I'm excited to chat about it. Absolutely. So so React, I think, is something that at this point, we've all probably heard of it, right? Like we it's it's one of the most popular JavaScript frameworks out there. It's going to show up in a lot of job postings and tutorials. Um, but what like, what is it? What is React? Yeah, so React is a front end library. And there's this distinction between library and framework. And I hate this debate, but React brands itself as a library, which means that it adds additional functionality to JavaScript. But we also use tools like Create React App or Next on top of that, that decides how we structure our code. And mm -hmm. The really nice things about React are first that it allows you to build these components. Components are essentially reusable chunks of code that you can use over and over again in your application. When I was starting out with React, I thought of these as writing your own custom HTML tags. And it goes beyond that, and that's not really accurate, but I still kind of like that analogy of you are creating these things that you can use that look like HTML, but you can reuse them over and over again. Something that I've always talked to with um, students about before is people think that you can write dry or HTML code that doesn't repeat itself when you're just starting out because mm. instructors are always like, don't repeat yourself, don't repeat right. yourself, don't repeat yourself. But for HTML code that doesn't really hold true, you can't really write HTML code that doesn't repeat itself. What you see is what you get. But with React, you kind of can in some ways. You mm -hmm. don't necessarily need to repeat all of your user interface code over and over again. Like say you had a table with a bunch of rows in it, you wouldn't need to write out the code for each row from scratch every time. Right. Other nice things about React is it uses JSX, which is a syntax that allows you to write what looks like HTML tags inside of your JavaScript code. Doesn't work natively within JavaScript. We have to use some tools on top of that to work. Mm -hmm. Those are some of my favorite React features. Yeah, I, don't know about you. I think so. What are, like all the things that you said, I think are are what makes React so powerful. And and I think where it really started to click for me was when I realized that. I was already doing a lot of the things that React did in my own projects before I started using React. I had, you know, I was using jQuery or I was using document.query selector or, you know, any number of, of JavaScript tools to loop over data and, and create HTML or to find a DOM element and replace something or to keep track of a value as somebody clicked around a page. And what I what I found was that like Every time I did this, it would be a, it would be subtly different, and it was really hard when I moved between projects to keep track of what like how it had been implemented or why it had been done the way it was done. And so we lost a lot of time trying to just remember why we were building things the way they were built. React does all of that work in a way that's consistent and and predictable, 
And so when I go in, if I'm looking for how do we loop over data, React has a really solid pattern. You'll see it used the same way all over the place. If you want to keep track of data, it has state management patterns that are really predictable and well documented. Um, a, a phrase that I hear a lot is that if you're not using a framework, you're writing a framework. And I think about that a lot when I'm when I'm choosing like how am I going to build this thing. And most of the time, something is complex enough. If I'm ever going to work on it again in the future. I probably want to use something that's documented for me, not something that I have to document myself. That's so true, especially when you're building something with a team of people where you need to follow similar conventions mm -hmm. between the group of people so that you aren't all confused by which code is in which position and the different techniques that everybody is using. So React really helps to standardize that, but it also really helps when things change as well. And the mm -hmm. so... React was written by Facebook and was initially used internally by them. So the example that I like to use a lot is remember like way back in the day when Facebook moved from likes to reactions. Yeah. So if they had to go and change that like button and every single place that it was, so <laughs> statuses, images, pages, that would be a lot of work and would probably lead to a lot of bugs. Like you'd have to do a find and replace of the whole project and introduce a lot of issues into that code. React helps manage this so you would only need to change that like functionality in one place. And changing it in one place means that there's going to be less bugs. People know where to look for those mm -hmm. changes instead of across the whole entire project. So as your project scales, using something like React is going to be so helpful for that. Absolutely. Uh, so I saw a question in the chat that's a, uh, probably a good context setting question. How much JavaScript does somebody need to know to write React code? Ooh, that's such a good question and such an age old one too. I see this debated so often online. And I will say that when I dove into React, I actually did not know that much JavaScript. I had just kind of started out with it. And honestly, I thought that certain point parts of React for JavaScript in certain point parts of JavaScript for React, which is probably not great. So I would recommend learning the JavaScript fundamentals first. So you know variables, loops, functions, classes if possible as well. And you feel pretty comfortable with those things in order to continue on with something like React because React is JavaScript. And mm -hmm. so any of those things that you learn in JavaScript are going to apply to React. You'll just have a more solid foundation. That being said, none of this is mandatory. Everybody comes from a different path. And so if you didn't come from that place, I didn't really either. And I don't want to invalidate that. I'm just going to say that it's probably going to be easier if you do know a little bit of JavaScript first. Yeah, I, I think like to to echo that because I feel like that's an important thing to say a bunch of times. Everybody's going to have some different base level of knowledge and there is no such thing as a correct level of knowledge. <laughs> like we yeah. all are going to know things and we're not going to know other things and and you know, I I've, I've just learned some you know, I've been writing JavaScript now for 15 years and and uh Suze Hinton was on my stream a, a month or two back and showed me something that I had zero idea existed that really changed my life for the better. And it was like a built-in JavaScript feature. I just, you know, how would I, I didn't know. Somebody had to tell me. And so yeah. I think that the the thing is we can, what we're using these tools for is, is solving problems. And you can start anywhere and solve a problem. The more expertise you gain, the less mental friction you will encounter while trying to solve problems. Like, that that's the most cliched, like <laughs> oversimplified answer, but but it's true. The more you know, the easier this is, but that that can come from any direction. You can start in the middle and work outward. You can start at the end and and like inherit a React app and learn JavaScript as you as you deconstruct it. Or you can go and, and go through a course and, and like learn the very, very basics before you ever try to do anything else. As long as you keep learning, you're going to get there. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, cool. So, I mean, I, I, I love uh, I love this kind of abstract talk about it all. I think there's there's so much that we could talk about and, and chat. Make sure that you ask questions as we're going, because, you know, especially with these these kind of intro sessions, um, a lot of times we don't know what what 
we should cover because there's so much to cover. Um, and let's see. Uh, there's some questions. So there are a couple questions that we're not going to dive into, I don't think. Like what, one question that I see here is, uh, are like functional components preferred over class components? Those sorts of questions are, they feel very much like preference, right? Like, What's your take on that? Yeah, yeah. I think that's something that we can discuss as we get into the demo and talk about why we're doing certain things. But I would agree that that's mostly preference and maybe depends on the era that you're writing React in and the mm -hmm. the project that you're working on as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, and I think like something that maybe we should start by talking about a little bit is is the care with which the React team rolls out changes. Um, yes. And, and you know something that I thought was really cool was when they when they rolled out React 16, React 17, they didn't really ship breaking changes. They shipped like new features, and so stuff that worked in you know like years ago still runs. And oh and yeah, that feels yeah. kind of different. Like what's the what's the oldest code base that you're working in right now? <laughs> <laughs> Me personally, I. Have, I'm not writing in an old code base whatsoever, Oof, but lucky. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. So I started writing React again before ES6 classes existed. Oh, wow. I had to write objects in order to write React components. So a totally different architecture than was introduced when ES6 classes were introduced. Um, and then now with hooks, I, I think that hooks and functions are function-based components are so great and such a step forward, but I, I've definitely been there for the kind of progression of React. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. So a lot of the questions that are coming in now are, are very specific. So let's, let's actually switch over so we can look at things. I think it'll be easier to show than tell here. So I'm going to move us over to the pair programming view and let's take a quick minute to shout out the sponsors, the show, uh, like all shows, is being live captioned right now by Jordan, who is with us. Jordan is from White Coat Captioning, and uh, this is all available on the homepage of learnwithjason.dev. Um, that is made possible through the generous sponsorship of Netlify, Fauna, Auth0, and Hasura, all of whom are kicking in to make this show more accessible to more people, which means a lot to me, and I hope that you are getting some value out of it. Uh, also, make sure you go and follow Ali on Twitter. She has a just wonderfully rich feed of uh, excellent information that uh, you're gonna you're gonna get a lot out of. Um, we talked earlier about the Ladybug podcast. That is another great resource that is uh, full of a lot of good laughs and a lot of good information. Um, we learn code is the blog that Ali writes about. And uh, were there any other resources I did not link to yet? I don't think so. This is amazing. Your setup is so gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, impressive. so let's do this. Uh, I'm going to pull up a terminal and now I don't know what to do. What's the, what's the first thing that you would recommend if you were going to start with a react project? Amazing. Let's use create react app. So create okay. react app is a tool that allows us to scaffold a React project. I kind of hinted at this, but some of React won't work in the browser by default. We have to set up some build tools in order to make it so that our app will actually work. So Create React App does a lot of this setup for us. Okay. There's this tool called Webpack that it has, and it has some nice dev tools like hot reloading. So we can run the command npx create React App and then your application's name, and that will scaffold a bunch of files for us, and we'll dive into those before starting. Okay. And so for anyone who's seeing this for the first time, um, npx is something that ships with npm, which is part of the node uh, library. So if you don't have node installed, you will need node and uh, we can link to that really quick. Node.js.org. There you go. If you do need node, uh, you can install it through there. That is going to, it's going to be pretty necessary these days for, for all JavaScript. Uh, if you're, if you're building anything um, and NPX just lets us run a command without having to actually install it. So this will go get it and then we'll run it. And then I'm just naming my project. Let's learn react. 
It's such a nice tool because you don't need to update things in order to have the latest version. It just does that automatically for you. And it's also really secure. So NPX is great to great to use. Yeah, this is this is one of the need if this just worked. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so this is this is uh, I think NPX was a that's a Kat Marchand special um, who Cat uh, was at at NPM for a long time, it built a lot of the, the great features there. Uh, and is now working on a lot of Rust tooling, which is a whole new space. If you're interested, I do have an episode on Rust while we're waiting for NPX to finish there, um, where Prince came on and taught us the intros to Rust. Let's see if we can find it. How's my how's my Googling? Is this it? Here it is. Yeah, what is Rust? And this is, uh, this is a lot of fun. And you get to hear me scream at the top of my lungs. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, I need to watch this. I've heard such great things about Rust, but it's a little intimidating to me. Not going to be not going to lie on that one. Like no joke. It's it's heavy. Like I've never written any kind of C like language uh, or you know, I I've, I've gone as deep as as like the far descendants of of C like <laughs> languages. So getting into something like Rust, I was like, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can do this. This is pretty back endy. Um, but there's such great tools like rustlings and, um, you know, the, uh, some resources that Prince talks about in this episode that are, are like truly excellent. And, and it's such a really, truly excellent community, which I, I think that is, um, that is something that is worth kind of noting in any situation like this, right? Like what type of community are you walking into if you're going to go and try to learn something new and the rust community is so top notch. Um, the the Party Corgi Discord that I hang out in often is a, a great resource for Rust if you are interested in such things. Um, did I spell that wrong? Oh, it doesn't have a hyphen. In. There it is. Uh, Party Corgi, go find that. Uh, Swarlow, you are not that late. We are we are just now installing the project. So I have run, uh, I've run create React app, and that's all we've done so far. So I'm now inside this project, and we can see that we've got a few things here. We've got our source. Um, do I have, I think this created, a, did this create a new Git project too? Yeah, it does, which is oh, super nice. nice. You don't need to run Git init or anything like that. Oh, you can get already set up for you. That is very nice. So I'll open this up in code so that we can take a look at it. And Amazing. So you can see that oh, that wait. create react app command created a bunch of files for oh, us. We didn't oh. create these. It did it automatically. So my setup is a little bit broken because I have uh, like a, all of my folder is is in a Git repo. So I think it breaks that automatic initialization. Um, oh. But so That's now I've, now that I've fixed that, here we go. So we've got a, a basic folder here and let's see. So. Nice. It comes with instructions. That's always good. <laughs> Super helpful. And it's got testing stuff. That's always nice. React, React DOM. Here's React scripts. Ooh, Web Vitals. Is that new? That's a good question. I think it's been in there for a little bit, but I haven't looked into what it does. I should look into these things a little bit more. I feel like I just yeah, use the them and sometimes I don't look too deep. The, the Web Vitals thing is really cool. It does... Um, like performance marks for for the the metrics that you get in like a lighthouse test. It's oh, like it's so cool. Contentful paints and stuff like that. So you get these these really nice reports on on whether or not you're building a performant app, which is which is really cool. So important. That's so cool. Um, okay, so I am now. I think I have a project, right? So can I yeah. can I just run this? Yeah. So if you run npm run start from your terminal that will open up a server for you here we go look at this holy buckets did that just work indeed it did <laughs> there we go we we've got uh we've got ourselves an app we we made it work so i'm going to put these side by side so that we can kind of look at stuff here um so let's take a look and it looks like we have like an index. Oh, so we would need to add code. Here we go. Is that right? So um, the index is the first file that connects everything together. So 
actually in that public directory, you have an index.html file. Okay. And we don't need to use this. So if you're following along, you don't need to open this up. But I just want to show that this is what is including our React code. Mm -hmm. So if you scroll down a little bit, there is, they added a lot of comments, so there's more scrolling. But there's this element with the ID root in there. Mm -hmm. And this element is what all of our React code is going to attach to. So there is an HTML file. We just don't need to worry about it because of the build tools that we have set up through Create React App. They are going to handle all of this for us and insert our JavaScript and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the and this is maybe where it starts to diverge a little bit from from what we think of as like traditional building a web page. If you're coming from HTML and CSS, you would think, well, how does this work? Because there's no content, right? Um, exactly. But so exactly. React React does something called a VDOM. And, and somebody asked what that is. So maybe this is a good time to talk a little bit about that because since, since we're going to be uh, sticking a bunch of stuff into this root div. Yeah, yeah. So... React use is this virtual representation of the DOM. And if you've written normal vanilla JavaScript, the DOM stands for document object model. And that allows you to interact with the HTML code within your JavaScript. So you hear a lot about like DOM manipulation, which is when you change your HTML using JavaScript. React kind of turns all of this on its head and tracks changes to your code within React itself. And this allows you to do a lot just in JavaScript without having to manually update the DOM yourself. Mm -hmm. So we'll kind of see what that means as we go through this, but it's it's really nice to have. Yeah, it, it, and it's like, it gives us some uh normalization stuff like one of the things that's really tricky with the dom is like event handling because the event handling in internet explorer is a little bit different than the event handling in chrome is a little bit different from like embedded browsers on on different devices and so you would have to write all this extra code to make that work the same way and react uses its um it, what they call synthetic events and the virtual dom to kind of smooth over a lot of these interactions which i i it, it's such a like coming from the world where, you know, you have to write these kind of browser specific hacks or you're including a lot of like, you know, check the browser for, you know, if uh, document dot query selector or document, you know, contains query selector, all then do this or you have to do like a regular query selector or get element by ID or all these things. You know, there's this really complicated kind of fallback structure for browser support and that all gets rolled up into the framework so that if you run it, it just works and it feels nice. <laughs> yes, that's, that's so true. So it's great for developer experience, but also the way that the virtual DOM works, it makes transitions feel very smooth. So mm. whenever you load JavaScript onto a page, it's going to be less performant than if you don't, right? HTML is the thing that the browser understands best. So that's going to be the most performant. But there's also this idea of perceived performance, and that's how fast a page feels to your user, even if behind the scenes it's using more JavaScript, and so the mm -hmm. page has a little bit more weight to it. So I think the virtual DOM makes it so that the transitions are a little bit smoother and things feel a little bit faster to the end user, even though in actuality maybe it's not as performant. Yeah, and that and that's a good point too, because like I, a lot of the the arguments about this get dogmatic. Like, should you ship JavaScript or should you only ship HTML? And yeah. it's easy for someone to just like draw a hard line and say yes or no. And and the the truth, as with most things in programming, is it depends. Like it depends, gotta... <laughs> yeah. And it depends on your project too. Um. Well, cool. So so looking at this, uh, so we looked at that index.html, and in the index.html we have this root div. So then when I come back to my index.js, uh, this is the first thing that reacted. So what's happening in this file? So in this file, 
This react dom dot render method or function is taking two arguments. The first one is the app component, and we're getting a preview of this JSX syntax here. Mm -hmm. Kind of looks like HTML, but we're writing it in JavaScript code. And so we're saying that our app component, which we'll get to in a few minutes, is going to be attached to the element with ID root, which we just saw in that HTML file. We also have this React strict mode thing, and this is just for like development. It's going to give us better error messages, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's like stuff that isn't wrong, but will be eventually is, is the difference. Like yeah, it's, for it's sure. like not now, but soon we're going to make a change that will, that will cause this to act differently. So you could, you should change this now so that your stuff doesn't break later is that's at least that's how I've understood it. I haven't actually like dug deep into what strict mode does. Yeah, it's mostly just warnings and things like that. This is actually pretty new to create React app. I remember oh, it nice. coming in and all my students being like, what is going on in here? But <laughs> um, <laughs> it changed overnight. But we don't need to worry about it too much. It'll just give us more warnings as developers. It's not going to really impact the end user. The really important part is that line nine there that's taking that app component and attaching it to the um, document with L an ID root. Nice. And that it looks like is coming from here. Line four, we're importing app. And so it, it looks like we're importing a couple things. Um, the web vitals, I think we can, we're not going to worry about that today. There's a, a link here if you want to learn more about that, but we're importing react and react Dom. So I can see where we're using react Dom. This makes sense to me. Um, where are we using React? Why do we import React? It looks like on line eight, we're using React.strict mode. So we're using ah. the strict mode from React there. Okay. Um, it used to be that every file that you used React in, you needed to import it up until super, super recently. And that will make it so that you can use JSX within the file. But the very last or the most recent version of React makes it so that you don't need to import React into every file oh, anymore. Nice. So now it'll work without it. But up very until cool. very recently, any file you use this JSX syntax in, you needed to import React. OK. And then we're importing CSS. And so this is something that that is, uh, this caught me off guard when I first looked at, at, CS, uh, at React. So this is a plain style sheet. How come I don't have to use a link, like a link tag, to get this in? Um, because this isn't JavaScript, right? This is this is something else. Yeah. So this syntax is given to us using JavaScript modules, and we're using this build tool Webpack under the hood. That's going to allow us to import and export things the way that we are here. So it looks a little bit different than linking a CSS style sheet like you may have in the past if you've used vanilla HTML and CSS, but this syntax will do the same within our React app. Nice. And so that that is maybe the first thing that we're seeing that is um, very specific to React that's not JavaScript. Like we couldn't just open up a new JavaScript file and import a CSS file. This is now something that React is providing for us, or specifically Webpack is is providing for us uh, as part of our React setup. Yes, um, yeah. So not necessarily React specific, but we do need to use additional tools in order to get this. It wouldn't work natively within the browser, yeah. nor would those lines eat through 10. And, and so I think this is the part where it becomes important, like, when we were talking earlier about whether you whether you need to know JavaScript, this is where it starts to get like helpful because knowing that this is something that's being set up in your Create React app project and not something that's supported in JavaScript will make it easier to debug and understand why things are happening the way they're happening. It's not strictly knowledge; it's not necessary. You can absolutely just pick this up and run with it. Um, but it's it's again that like the more you know the easier it is to to dig deeper. Yeah, um, for sure. So I, I don't want to get too deep into it, but a few people have asked, so I'm going to ask you. Uh, there's a lot of talk about CSS in JS um, versus this kind of like this is just CSS. This will work in the browser. It just functions. What? How do you feel about CSS in JS, where we actually kind of write it in line 
um, as opposed to this or, or other approaches? Kind of how do you how do you make decisions on on what approach you're going to use? Yeah, I think that's another one that at least to me it depends on the project. Other people have more opinions on this than I do, but I think that CSS and JS is great, especially when you are working on big projects where having these styles be reusable in that way or conditional is really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, React doesn't really care how you write your CSS code, so you can just write it like normal as well. There are lots of different options here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and so, you know, my what like my take on this is is exactly the same as yours. I think that it depends on the team. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish, how many people have to work on it, how far into the future it needs to survive. I'm a big fan of just like a CSS file. It makes me really happy to know that everything's yeah. in one place. But when you get into the hundreds of pages or hundreds of components, it gets really hard to track <laughs> and you start accidentally introducing bugs and, you, and somebody will accidentally, you know, they'll break something or they'll add like important hacks to get around specificity problems that they, they don't know enough to solve. And, and then yeah. you're just in for like sad times. Right. So, and, and that's where I think the power of CSS and JS starts to shine is when you are like really scoping things down to just the component. Um, but uh, that is probably a whole episode in and of itself. It would be to talk oh, through the, sure. the trade-offs. Uh, so instead let's, let's get back to react and let's look at an actual so the the component that we looked at before we imported a component and then we used it so let's look at how that's built and that's this is that's this file so can you walk us through kind of what's going on in here yeah so if you go to that local host i think it's on 8000 tab that we have in the browser you can see that when we ran our react application it actually has something displaying on the page right now and yes. that stuff is written in our app js right now so you can see that on line eight we have this logo that we are rendering on the page and so this is, again, this JSX code. We have this function, and it's returning what looks like HTML from it. It's not actually HTML. It's a little bit different than that. But you can edit any of this HTML code, and then those edits will actually show up on the page. So if we strip everything in this div with class name app. OK. Now we've just got an empty div. Yep. And if we save this file, then it should make it so that now our localhost 3000 or 8000 is just a white page. We're mm -hmm. no longer returning anything from it. It So whatever we return from this return inside of our app is going to show up on the page. So if we put like an each one hello world in there. Okay. There it is. There's our hello world. There you go. And and a couple things that are worth noting here. Um, so this is just HTML. Like uh, the, the major difference here is that we're writing class name instead of class. Is there... Yes. Do you know why we do that? Yeah. So in JavaScript, there's a thing called a class. And that thing called of a class is there for us to use object-oriented programming within our JavaScript code. So it means something there. It also means something within HTML. In HTML, it's a class for your CSS to decide which elements to apply a set of styles to. So since these mean two different things within HTML and JavaScript, we got to pick one to use. And since we're already in JavaScript in React, mm -hmm. we change some of those HTML attribute names. So one of them is class theme, which we use instead of class. That will work exactly like a CSS class that you may have used in the past. Just this time, you call it something else so that we can still have that thing called a class within JavaScript as well. And there are a few of these, right? So it's it's any time that there's a collision with a JavaScript keyword. So yeah. another one that, that I can think of is like you would have a for loop, um, but you can also have a label with a for attribute to describe like which input the label is for. And so that one, um, 
What do they rename that one to? It's HTML4. Like that, yeah. And so you'll see a few of these in React, and this can be a little bit of a gotcha as you as you initially start. But the nice thing about something like um, like Create React App is I think it's just going to tell us. Yeah, it'll give you a warning in the console. So it'll actually work as expected. Just it'll tell you. And it Did says you mean class name. Yeah. Of class. So this is really nice. Like I, it's something that I think is, is again, it's well considered because we're trying to avoid collisions, but they're not breaking the app. They're just telling you like, Hey, this is probably not going to work the way that you want in all, in all situations. And I, uh, I dig For that. Sure. Um, well, cool. So, okay. And so then, um, from here, what, what else should we, what else should we do? Like, what should we do next? Okay, so my idea for an app is to build a color switcher. And what okay. that will allow us to do is have a couple buttons that are different colors. And when we click on one of them, it changes the background color of the whole page. Ooh, so nice. it's nothing super complex, but it's going to show us a bunch of the fundamentals of React. I'm into it. Cool. All right, so, so I'm going to just clean this up to get to just the stuff we need. So I, I removed the logo because we're not using it anymore. And I think I think we're ready. So what what should we do first? Let's create three buttons. Okay. So one will be red, one will be blue, and one will be yellow. Or we could do other colors as well, but I like the primaries. <laughs> um, why did I? What have I done? I've forgotten. Oh no, I've forgotten how all of my shortcuts work. Why doesn't this do what I <laughs> want it to? There it is. Uh, red, yellow and blue wow spelling today is <laughs> it's hard it's going well okay type a cool and let's go ahead and add some classes to those two so we'll use the class name attribute on each of these and make them correspond to the color on each button. So we'll add a red class to the red one, yellow class to the yellow one, and a blue class to the blue one. Okay. Oh, here we go with a stampede. <laughs> I'm so glad that I brought this back. I, I had the sound off for a long time because it was just like ear splittingly loud. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured out how to turn it down, so I'm I'm very happy about that. That's so fun. Um, okay, now let's go ahead and add in another div that contains all of these buttons and stuff, just so that we can position them on the page and still color that app div. Gotcha. Okay, so I'm going to add my container here, and this functionally didn't do anything. Um, exactly. Okay. Yeah, just for styling for now. And so then let's add some CSS in our app.js, or sorry, our app.css. So okay. this is another thing that we can chat about real quick, is that before we saw that the index.css was being imported, and now we're using the app.css, this is another decision that you can make. So you can either put all of your styles for your whole entire application in that index.css. That's perfectly valid if that's what you want to do. But you could also write component-specific styles within the component name.css file if you wanted to. So okay. in this case, we're using this app.css file to write CSS for our app.js, and we are importing that app CSS in the app.js file. OK. Um, and so now, yeah, so if I do something like, let's just make this red to see what happens, we can see that there. And so you want this to be like full width? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Let's make it so that that app is the whole height and width of the page. OK, so let's go with like, we'll make it a grid, and then we'll make it height 100, and maybe like a width of 100. That does what we want. And then we could do, because we've got the, the thingy here, we can play with a little bit of grid stuff and like uh, align items center. I think we'll do it. 
<laughs> vertical vertical centering in CSS. Uh, Amazing. They said it couldn't Amazing. be done. I love that you did it this way too, because I would have done it a different way. So it's so fun the different ways to to do something just like making the div the height and width of the page. So. Very yeah, I mean, it's it, this is, I think, the thing that's so exciting and so frustrating about CSS is that you can solve the problem a thousand different ways. And, so, and so it's hard to get a straight answer because the answer, as with everything, is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. OK, so let's also make it so that our red button's red, our yellow button's yellow, and our blue button's blue. OK, so let me make this to start then probably do you think just like make it white again so that we can yeah. see our buttons? OK, and so we can do something like have a button style that will give us some basics. So we can do like a border of uh, like a black border and we can give it a little bit of a like a border radius to make it look buttony <laughs> um, and maybe make the font size a little bit bigger. So like that and then we can do a button dot red can have a background of red um, and then we can duplicate these and do blue and yellow and i think that'll get us oh that's rough um <laughs> uh, let's make the blue one we'll do a, a ah, white behold my bucket <laughs> and maybe to make that just a little bit more legible we can make it bold Okay, and maybe a margin of like, give it a little space. Look at it go. There we go. Those Amazing. are, this one might not pass contrast, but um, we're learning. We're learning today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, one other thing, and we could come back to this down the road, but maybe just so that we can abandon this style sheet, is if we remove the button from the red class and the blue class and the yellow class it'll mm. make it so that we could reuse the red class on the body background as well oh interesting okay just to make our lives a little bit easier in the future but if you wanted to just style the buttons that's perfect but this will make it so that we can reuse the red class on the whole entire body i get what you're saying yeah no that totally makes sense too and and we'll get to see some cool stuff like the color adjusting to the background so that this will stay legible as well, which is kind of nice. Yes. OK. Super handy. All right, so we've got some some basic styling set up. We've got our our container. I've got buttons. But if I start clicking these, nothing happens. Nothing happens at all. What we want to have happen, though, is if we add a class right now to the app div, if we add like the red class to it, See how the Look at it go. background changes. And if we change it to yellow or blue, it would do that as well. We want to, in our React code, make it so that we can add this second class dynamically. Yes. So we could add a red class or a yellow class or a blue class in our React code. OK. Just as a preview of what's to come. Great. Okay. So now we need to have a variable that changes to red, yellow, or blue. And within React, if we have a variable that we want to have change within our component as it runs, we're going to use useState. useState is a React hook. React hooks are a little bit more recent within React. They're they were introduced at the end of 2018, I believe. So they are definitely in the last couple of years instead of something that's been around the whole entire time. But we can import this use state hook from React. And this is going to allow us to use functions to write our React code. Um, back in the day, you needed to use classes to mm -hmm. write these React components. If you had any state within them, and state is the data that's going to change within the life of our component. Um, so if you're looking at older React code, you'll see it all be classes. And up until recently, that's what you needed to use. If you see things like component did mount or anything like that, those fall into those 
class-based components. Mm -hmm. The function-based ones with hooks are more recent, and these hooks allow us to use the React lifecycle and state within these function-based components. Uh, the syntax from them is really nice. It's a lot less verbose than writing these class-based components. Mm -hmm. I think both are still totally valid, but I really like writing hooks now. So that's what we'll be doing today. I think yeah. it's a little bit more beginner-friendly too. I it, it definitely, so <laughs> it's beginner-friendly once you get past the initial weirdness of destructuring syntax, I think is the is the part that throws me the most. So there's a couple things that happen here where like this, if you've never seen it before, is destructuring. So what we're doing is we're getting react and then we're doing use state equals react use state like that. Um, yes. But we don't need all of react for that, right? We can just go right here and then we get to skip that whole step. And that is really, really pleasant. And then use state is kind of this, so if I'm going to use use state, right? It's a function, so I know that much. Um, how do we actually interact with this? Like, does it? How, how do we? How do we use it? Okay, so let's provide something to use state. So let's say in quotes red, just to start out with. Okay. And then what we'll do is we'll save this to a variable. So const color equals use state red. Okay. And then let's console log what color is on the next line. I'm going to do it like this so that we can see the label. This cool. is one of my favorite debugging tips is if you, if you add the quotes like this, it'll say color and then what the value is. Love that. Okay. Cool. So we've got a color. And if you look in the console, this is actually giving us two things back. So it's an array with two items in there. The first item is red, and red is what we passed into that use state function. That's going to be our initial value for state. Usually you'll see like an empty string or an empty object or empty array or something like that passed in, but you can pass a default, and that will be what your state variable is set to by default. And again, state is just data that's going to change in our application. Then the second thing is a function. Mm -hmm. This function is given back to us by this use state function as well. And it's going to allow us to update that value in state. So if we wanted to change the variable or that's now set to red to be blue instead, we would use that function that's returned. Okay. And so if we look at that, like how you would maybe we can call this one state instead and then we would get color by doing like the first entry in the array exactly and then we would be able we can use the that function is how we would set the color and so we get it like this is that right yes you can very much do this and then now you have these two variables, color and set color you could use those within your application that being said most almost always you'll see this all in one line just because three lines of code every single time that you want to use this use state it's a little clunky and could lead to some bugs because more code than you need mm -hmm. and so what you'll normally see is on line five if we change state to an array with color and set color in there now we can drop all of that that will do the exact same thing where it's setting the first item in that array to the color variable, the second thing in the array to the set color variable. And now if we look, when we log color, it's it's red. It's not an array anymore. Not so and this is again, this is destructuring. So up here we're destructuring an object. That's where the, the curly boys come in. And then when it's an array, you use the square boys. Yeah, this is another thing where we were talking about knowing JavaScript versus knowing React. This is built into JavaScript, so you can do this in any JavaScript code that you want and just run it in the browser. This isn't a React feature or anything like that. It's just JavaScript. Yeah, exactly. And this is, I mean, this is something that it's a little a little head bendy when you see it the first time. But it's such a power up when you when you get comfortable with it because it just saves, like you said, if you write extra lines of code, that's more places for things to go wrong. If everything's contained, it just feels a little more, I don't know, approachable, a little less spaghetti-ish. 
<laughs> agreed. Agreed. Uh, the MDN documentation or Mozilla Developer Network, I think. Now I'm like, what does MDN stand for? Um, uses has really great documentation on array destructuring. So if you're interested in learning more, that's a really great resource. Destructuring assignment. This this will be a good uh, primer on that. There's probably more pages with more specific things in there, but that is uh, that is pretty excellent. Pretty much their stuff on everything is excellent. That's yeah. M MDN is is definitely my go to. I use it every single day. Amazing. So I think the next thing that we want to do is use that color variable within our class name. So mm -hmm. on line 10, we have the app class already there, but we can also have this secondary color here. And if you do that, this is going to add the word color to our div. But we want the variable instead of the word color. So if you look at it now. Yeah. How do I get it to show me? The HTML. Is I just question? switched to Firefox. And so I'm learning. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> here we go. I make the switch. I'm such a, I've been using Chrome for too long, though. You know, I, I fought it for as long as I could, but. Potato salad. <laughs> I fought it for as long as I could, but uh, I'm on an older MacBook. And Chrome now has like a memory leak or something where it gets completely unusable. It beach balls on me. So I, oh, no. I switched to Firefox out of out of necessity, uh, not out of any any particular stance. I'm actually still kind of salty at MDN for laying everybody off. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. I was a uh, Mozilla tech speaker part of that program, mm, which is yeah. really really cool. So I was really sad when that disbanded yeah. at the same time. Um, okay. Cool. So. We can use JavaScript variables within these class names. And what we'll do is we'll put that whole entire string, so everything from app to color within curly braces. The curly braces tell React that this is JavaScript code instead of just text. And then what we can do is change the double quotes to backticks, which will allow us to use string interpolation. OK. This is another ES6 thing, just JavaScript, not React. And then what we can do is put the color in curly braces and add a dollar sign before it. And this will allow us to have the color variable instead of just the word a color. And, and if you all were looking, you can see that as soon as I add that dollar sign, VS Code recognizes that this is something special and it changes the highlighting. And so that's that to me is, is always helpful to, to notice that if I remove this, it goes back to looking like a string. And now it now it knows that it's JavaScript. Text editors are so helpful. Like knowing oh your developer God. tools is one of the things that really just levels you up as a developer. Um, Absolutely. But now you can see that the word red is plugged in instead of the word color. And our background turned red to match. And if we changed it to blue, boom. Then we get blue as well. There we go. Okay. All right. I'm feeling it. So uh so from here then. We still, we just got to make these buttons click, clicky. Exactly. So in vanilla JavaScript, you would add an event listener to an element, tell listen for a person clicking on it, and then fire that event listener on click. And we're going to do the same thing within React. The syntax is a little bit different, but it's the same basic idea. OK. So what we'll do is inside of the open button tag on line 13, we'll add on click. Uh, line 13, add on click. OK. Um, and a, 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 there's a question in the chat about the curly braces around app color. Um, can, you, can you remind us why these ones are here? Yes. So anytime that we want to write JavaScript code, so we don't just want it to be a string, we need to add those curly braces in. And that will tell React that we want to write JavaScript code in this area. Great. Otherwise, it's like the hard coded word color instead of the string color or instead of the variable color. Great. And so um, I imagine we're probably going to need that right now, right? On this on click. 
Exactly. Yep. Okay. So we'll do on click equals curly braces. And then we can write a function inside of here. So maybe for now we can do an arrow function that console logs clicked or something along those lines. Okay, here's my, okay, auto formatted, that's helpful. So our on click, we have uh, an arrow function and it's gonna be a console log and that's all that this does. So now when we click red and only red, we should see a log, okay? It Nothing worked. happens when we click yellow or blue. Good, okay, all right. Cool, so we want to build on this a little bit more. And we discussed that we have this set color function. And the set color function is going to allow us to change what the color variable is. So what we'll go ahead and do is use that set color function inside the on click. Right in here? Yep. Okay. And we'll set it to red. Okay. And so is this like I can just copy paste this between each one, right? Yeah, let's try it out first, but I good call. Believe it good call. <laughs> oh, look at it go. Okay, so so red works, and if I I'll refresh the page so we can see that again. So we default to blue, right? If I click yellow, we haven't added anything. Blue haven't added anything. But when I click red, it calls this, and watch that. So do you see how it went white when I refreshed the page? How come it's yep. not doing that when I when I click red? This is like React nice transitions and all of that, but also because the variable set to blue by default. So it's not having to go back to white to go to red. Right. Yeah. Because like when we, when we refresh the page, we're doing like a whole load, right? Like I'm saying, Hey browser, go get this file and then load it and parse the JavaScript and then show things and re read the CSS. And now when I click this, it's it's it gets to skip all that, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's oh, that's so powerful. Like, and and this is kind of where I I feel like the for me at least now that we're getting into dynamic stuff like user interactions, this is where the light bulb really went on for me when I started using React. Was like, whoa, I can yeah. do all of that with this. It's and like, that's really the power of this state too, is that it'll automatically redraw for you without you needing to set anything. If the variable will just set, that will trigger the page repainting with the new color. And so now I can just pop between these. Exactly. Wow, that is cool. And and like, how nice is that, that it, it just works the way that we want it to work too, right? Like that's, um, that is, it's really, really slick that you can do this kind of stuff so quickly in, in real yeah life. yeah one other thing to talk about is i think people are like why can't you just do color equals blue or something along those lines instead of using the set color function and the reason for that is that the page won't actually update with the state if we do color equals that new um that new color so it is important to use the state because it will make it so that React automatically updates our page with our changes. Mm -hmm. So a question I have then is when I'm looking at this, um, and this is this is beautiful, but I can see like this also could get a little repetitive, where we've got like we're setting a class name and we're we're setting up the button and all this stuff. Is there a how would we use React to to simplify this a little bit? Yeah. Do you want to write a second component? Heck yes, I want to write a second component. Amazing, amazing. So this is the really <laughs> nice part of React is that we can start reusing this code. So our three buttons right now have really similar code in between them. They all have a class name. They all have an on-click event with a color. They all have the color as their text. And so instead of having to write this from scratch every single time, because again, the more code that we write, the more potential problems that we can have, right. we can reuse this as a component. And so we can write a second component by creating a second component file. So okay. maybe we'll call it button.js or color button.js. I think we can probably stick with button. And then, oh, so here's a question. 
index.js is not capitalized. App.js is capitalized. Should button be capitalized? I normally capitalize my component name files. Okay. So I would capitalize it. And and there's not like a rule for this. This is just a thing that it, it's more for like us to see, oh, this is capitalized. It means it's a component. Exactly. It's a convention. Got it. Got it. Okay. Cool. So in, inside of this file, we can create a second component. We will create a JavaScript function. Okay. Or copy that in too. We'll have to do that. Yeah, I, would, I figured we this is this is what we want to abstract out, right? Is like this is the part that gets reused. Exactly. And so if I want to create a function and I, I name it, I can just call it button, right? Yep. Okay. And then we want to return this button code from it. Okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> the one last thing that we need to do is export the button file or the button component, sorry, not the file. And that will allow us to import it into other files. So we've been using this import syntax throughout, uh, import use state from React or import app from app.js. Mm -hmm. If we want to import something into another file, we need to export it from the file that we write it in. And we're actually already doing this in the app.js, it's just down below. Oh, there it is. So same thing, we can just go down here and export default button is that right exactly okay what does default mean this is going to make it so that's the default export from the file and we can just import button from button js you so the so, we have the import app from app js within the index js this allows us to import like that okay so it's going to be like button.js um okay so now I have my button. And so if I if I didn't have the default, then what did we I? We would need to use that other import syntax where we're destructuring the item that's being um, imported. So, so with, more without like default, one. it would be like this. OK, yeah. that makes sense. OK, great. So now I have my button. I am getting an error. And it looks like, oh, I know why. It's because we've got this set color. But that, like, how did that get in here? We don't yeah, know. Yeah, <laughs> so that was <laughs> defined in our app.js or instead of in our button.js. So mm -hmm. why don't, for now, we just comment it out and make it so that our three buttons show up on the page as needed. And we'll come back to that set color in a minute. But that's a good note that right now our set color is erroring out because it's defined in my app.js but not in my bet in JS. We'll come back to okay. that. So um, to use this then, to, I can just delete this all together. Yep, we can delete these three buttons that we have written. And then or I we use can it. delete the first one. Yeah. Okay, all right, let's go. Cool. Okay, and first one worked. And if we put more than one on there, it would show up like we wanted as well. So let's get these buttons out. Now we've got our three buttons. Okay. Oop, but they're all red. Mm hmm There were some changes between the three different buttons. They were mostly the same, but the one thing that changed between them was the name of the color. And so what we can do is when we are creating an instance of the component, we can pass in the color for each button and then use that. And this is called using props. Props allow so, us to pass data from one component to another and make it so that we can have instances of a component that have information that differs between them. Okay. And so I'm I'm setting this up like I'm I just want to be able to say this is my this is my button and I want it to be blue. Exactly. So now okay. we have three buttons, each one has a different color. Got it. Cool. Now if we go back to the button JS. And I just saved and, and nothing happened here because we haven't used this yet, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. We still have the hard-coded red everywhere. So inside of line one, we're going to pass props as the argument to the function. Props. 
props. <laughs> <laughs> props. Pops would be fun too. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And if we console log what props is here. We will get what? Oh, look, our color of red, our color of yellow, our color of blue. So yeah. does that mean so, I can put I can put whatever I want in here and it'll just like give me that? Exactly. And underneath the hood, React is turning it into an object, which is more usable for us. So you can see that now that one has test and high in it. OK. All right. So that makes sense. I get that. So then I can I can just use this as like, so do I have to do it like this? You can directly use props.color if you want, but the string interpolation should work as well. So I can I can use it directly like I don't have to, to do this this bit yep. here. There you go. That looks cleaner to me. I'm happy. Cool. And then let's also set the Ooh, so now we've got one that. yellow, okay. one that's blue as well. And then on line eleven we can substitute in the props.color as well. And this will also need to go in curlies. So anything that we want to use the variable, we need to put curlies around. If you remove those curlies, every single button is literally going to say props that color. Got it. So this is the the curlies are are the signal to to react that like, hey, I'm I'm doing something here. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. And then it looks like I did. Uh, you know the the thing is lowercase. If we wanted to, we could go through here and use JavaScript to like make this uppercase, or or we could do something where you could write different text. But I think we I think we can call this good enough, right? Yeah, I think I think people will understand. Okay, amazing. So the last thing that we need to do is actually get this set color working. Yes. And right now we have set color wired up in App.js, and we're going to need access to color in that App.js style because that's where we use that variable to decide the um, color of the body. So okay. that needs to stay in the app.js component, but we also need to get access to that set color within this component. We just went over how to pass data from one component to another, mm -hmm. and that's props. So even though set color is a function, we can still send it as props from this app component to the button component. So I can just put it right in? Exactly like this, I think, because it's JavaScript. Exactly. OK. It needs the curlies since it's JavaScript. And then now in button.js, it needs to be, we can comment line 8 back in. But now this would come from props. And so we can we can destructure this now, right? Like we can use that same destructuring syntax and get exactly. like color. Thank you for the sub, Ben. I appreciate it. Oh, I can turn on my my goofy. Here we go. Look at look at me. Look at me <laughs> appreciating you. Um, oh my goodness. And so then we'll get set color. And so then I can just edit out the props dot here. Exactly. OK. Because that looks pretty helpful. That looks clean. Look at that. That is that is lovely. Amazing. Um, and then let's change the hard coded red on line seven to color as well. Or we could just make it so that every button turns the background red. Oh, that's a good catch. I was I would have missed that. So um, so now what we're doing is I'm passing in a color for my button, and we're dynamically telling set color what color to use. That's and so okay. So we you just showed something that I think is is so small but so important. We just made this completely dynamic. So check this out. Now we've got these buttons, and I can go red, yellow, blue. But also look at this. What if I go like purple and then I go into my app.css and add a purple button? Um, this is going to need to be on white, isn't it? Oh, whoops. I forgot to change the actual name of the thing. <laughs> there it is. And so now we have like support for purple. And so I didn't have to write new JavaScript. I just had to create a new instance of this button. That is really like this, I think, is where where the power of this comes in is like, you know, we can we can drop things in and out and just add more, more and more as we go um, really, really powerfully. Yeah. 
so handy. React is so great for for things like this. And you could even write it as an inline style so that you don't need to have the new class in here too, but we'll... Ooh, that's a fun idea. What if we tried that? So instead of... and Oh, we can do a little bit of CSS in, in JS here. Um, <laughs> So if we're if we're gonna do that, we would instead of using the class name, how would we do this? So we could add a style here. Okay. And then style is going to work a little bit different than inline styles in HTML. So okay. It's actually going to take an object instead. So this is going to look weird. We need two sets of curly braces. One set of curly braces to say that this is JavaScript. The okay. second set to say that this is an object of styles. Got and it, okay. And here, we can just do color. Or, or background color set to color, I think. Background, this isn't gonna work, is it? That's another really great catch. So the dash doesn't work as a variable name within JavaScript. Okay. We instead, within these styles, will use camel case. So we will delete the hyphen, but add a capital C. Got it. Amazing. And then we need, yeah, this should work. Okay. So and now then we've we got- we need to do the same thing with our app.js. With our app.js. Um, oh, you're right, you're right. Okay, so but for this one, oh, this is gonna get fun. So instead of using, well, we can just leave that actually. So then we're gonna have a style and we're going to set the background color to be color. And I can delete this. That's fine. OK. Cool. So now red, yellow, blue. And you can see like the, the thing that we lose is I can't change the text color without doing extra JavaScript logic. So yeah. this is where you know writing CSS for style things starts to make more sense. <laughs> um, for but sure. check this power out, because now if I do like I don't know what's a uh, here's a good here's a good JavaScript color tomato. Now I have a tomato button, and I can just keep going. Like I can I can add more and more buttons, and I don't have to change anything else. It's just gonna work, and that I think is is really where this starts to shine, because um, now we've got this flexibility, right? And and like we could do this with uh, with more thoughtful CSS generation too, where it was you know. And, and really in any production app, probably the designers would, would pound down our doors and, and drag us out into the street <laughs> if we started arbitrarily adding color options in. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, but this is cool for showing how JavaScript stuff works. Um, I even have had in apps before a function that determines how dark the background color is and then decides on white or black text depending on that. Oh, very so that cool. Could be a function that you could add in. Absolutely. I think there's like Stack Overflow snippets for stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what what is yeah, there's there are like contrast checkers that you can that you can use um to make that stuff work. So yeah, this is this is super cool. I feel like this is a, this is kind of a solid overview. So so maybe just to recap what we've done thus far, we used uh, the Create React app, um, which is somewhere over here. Create React app here. So we we just used Create React app, which is a, a one liner um, with npx. So <laughs> that's not what I meant to send you. Um, just dropping arbitrary React code into the chat. Uh, so the um, we use Create React app, so NPX Create React app, and then we called this one Let's Learn React. We started it, and then we we just edited like app.js, and that's really all we've had to do. And we've been able to create what I would consider to be a pretty, like a pretty full featured. You know, this isn't like an app we're going to ship to the app store or anything, but but in terms of what we were able to do, we've got user interactions, we've got styles, we've got dynamic loading, the, the fact that this isn't reloading the page when we click buttons. There's a lot going on in here. Yeah, for sure. And it also shows a lot of the different concepts within React. So we have two different components and reusable components is one of the core pieces of React that really makes it beneficial um, that you have all of your 
user interface and user interaction code all bundled into one. So we have all of our logic for changing the background color and all of the code that shows up in the app, in the app.js. Mm-hmm. And then we also are showing the two types of data within React as well. So state is any data that's going to change within your component. So our color variable here is in this app, in this component is state. So our color changes, our background changes to match that state color. And so that's state. The other one is props and props allows us to pass data from one component to another, making it so that our different buttons can have different colors associated with them. And how we can combine them too, because we're able to to use props to pass around this function to control state, which For sure. is which is really kind of interesting because it 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 shows that this isn't like an either or. It's it, you you get to do any combination of things, um, and and as you get more advanced, like there are lots of patterns that are established that make this more approachable. Um, well, cool. so so oh geez, this I'm I'm so happy with how much we got done. Uh, so we've got about 15 minutes left and I, I wonder, is there anything else that you wanted to build or, or would you prefer to show like some extra resources for people to take next steps? Ooh, other resources would be great. Yeah, let's, let's do that. So if I, if I want to go further from here and, and learn something more, um, where should I go? What, what's a good starting point? There are so many, so many React resources out there. I think some of my favorites are Ken C. Dodds creates so many great React resources. Uh, he has some courses that are out there that are really excellent. Um, the React documentation itself, I think, is really great as well. I always love starting at the documentation level just because you, then you understand where the authors are coming from of React itself. Mm-hmm. And you get really, really reliable information. Um, They also have a ton of resources linked in here. I think under the community tab of resources that they recommend for getting started with React as well. My, where should I be looking here? Is this? Up next to, to, it's like docs, tutorial, blog. Oh, community, community. community. I was looking in the, the sidebar here. Oh no, you're good. Let's see, articles. Oh, look at that. There's a whole bunch in here. Yeah, and so these will be mostly free as well, which is really great. And they've got different modalities too. So if you learn better via video or something along mm-hmm. those lines, there's that as well. Uh, Dave Sedia also has really, really great React resources. Let's see. Complete React tutorial. That seems... Yeah, this resource is amazing. If you want to go deeper on what we learned today, it'll be review for the first couple of sections and then go deeper on how to uh, call an API and things like that from mm-hmm. here and actually deploy it as well. You know, one thing that that might be worth looking at, I we might not have time, but uh, the, the chat was asking if we could cover use effect really quick. Ooh, that's going to be a tough one in the time we have remaining. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. It, if if somebody wants an intro to use effect, do you have something that they could watch that would kind of show them how it works? I don't personally, but th- this tutorial linked here, uh, the Dave Sedia one has a bunch on use effect in it. So that's really great. And also the React docs as well. Uh, Dan Abramoff, this is more advanced, but he also has a massive blog post about use effect. It's like a half an hour read or something like that. So I really, really enjoyed that when I was teaching React, just because it really gave me a great basis on that. Um, is it, it's, on, it's on overreacted, right? Yeah, it's on overreacted. Uh, come on. I think it's maybe... Maybe it's called something different. Complete guide to use effect. Was that it? It's this one, right? This giant 49 minute. Holy crap. Yeah. Okay. So it's even more than half an hour. It's 49 minutes. So this is a book. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But this, so this is, this is deep, deep. Um, But I think, I think what's cool about this is like, this is sort of that choice. You can always choose how much you want to learn because the, the, Docs here 
for use effect are going to show you what happens. Like it'll it'll run, you know, use effect is is for I guess the shorthand is like you when things change. Like if if something happens like the component mounts or unmounts or a piece of state changes or or something you can use use effect to track that um but it's so it's i feel like it's that easy and it's that hard is a is a good description of use effect like <laughs> it's it sounds so simple when you describe it and then you start looking at the edge cases and what all can be done with it and it's like wow that does a lot it does a ton and it also is a little dangerous too. I feel like I've never written as many infinite loops as I have with use effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's definitely something that is like, if there's anything in React that's going to trip you up, it's it's this is probably where it's going to start is is going to be in use effect because it's use effect is like an escape hatch from the way that React wants you to do things, which means that you are now kind of stepping into into territory where things get tricky because everybody's got their own way that they do things. Everybody's got like their different use cases. This is, you're going to see a lot of animations end up in, in use effect stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's worth learning. It's worth learning like deeply to make yeah. sure that you like we'd that, need a whole nother yeah one of these sessions for use effect. Absolutely. Um, on these same lines, I want to give two shout outs to developer tooling for React. The first is the um, React Dev Tools in the browser. I have used that Chrome extension for forever, and it will really help you debug what state and props are at different points. And if you have anything like a use effect that's going crazy, why it's doing that. Um, the other thing that would be really helpful is that there is a library of snippets for VS code that I use all the time. And it's like react snippets or something like that. And it allows you to use Emmet like abbreviations to re write react components. I'm so reliant on things like this because. Is it this um, one here? I don't think it's this one. Let me see which one I have. It's like react ES seven something. ES7, React, Redux, GraphQL, React Native that snippets? One. Okay. Yes. Great. Oh, yeah. Two million installs. That looks useful. I actually don't have this one, and now I now I want it. Um, it is so nice. You can do, like, RFC to write a React function-based component or ooh. RCC to do a class-based component. Dang. Okay. All right. You have my attention. Um, okay. So <laughs> that is, that is super cool. And, uh, with that, I think we are running a little bit low on time. So let me do one more shout out to, uh, to Jordan and white coat captioning who have been with us today, uh, doing live captioning for the show that is always available at lwj.dev, uh, right here in this big box while we're live. Um, that is made possible through the generous sponsorships of what happened here. Look at that. What did I do? I have no idea, but David is getting a lot of attention. Um, <laughs> that is made possible through the generous sponsorships of Netlify, Fauna, Auth0, and Hasura, all of whom are kicking in to make this show more accessible, which I very much appreciate. Uh, Ali, if people want to find more about you, um, where should we send them? So a couple places. First, Twitter. I feel like that's the hub of everything. Um, then... I also have a YouTube channel that's kind of new. It's Ali Spittle Dev. And my blog is We Learn Code. I also hang out on Dev2 a lot. I don't know. I, I'm pretty much out, uh, a Spittle everywhere on the internet. OK, is this the right channel? Yes, it looks like it. Yes. OK. So go, yeah, go go subscribe. Go do all the things. Get uh, get in touch with Ali. Definitely follow her on Twitter. It is a, a, uh, a great feed to be a part of. Um, Ali, thank you so much for taking some time to hang out with us today and teach us React. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been really, really awesome. I've I've had an absolute blast chat. I hope you had as much fun as we did. Uh, make sure you tune in later this week because we've got so much good stuff coming. Uh, Ali was here today. We have uh, uh, Scott Moss coming on Thursday, and we're going to learn Next.js. Next is a React framework so it's like a framework built on top of react for building sites it has all sorts of extra features that we will talk about 
Um, it's a great kind of next step if you've been learning React and you want to learn <laughs> what else you can do. Here we go with another Stampede. Um, and then next week, we are going to be talking about Vue and the Composition API. So Ben Hong was here and he did a great introduction to Vue. You can go find that in the, the episodes list. Uh, and then Sarah Drasner on Thursday is going to come in and talk about how she looks for people, what makes someone stand out when she's hiring, and also how we can do more to make ourselves uh, more likely to get that interview, to get that job. Uh, that's going to be a really interesting episode. It's going to be Q&A based. Um, so go check out the schedule. Make sure you add the calendar so that you can see things coming. It's going to be a great, a great next couple of weeks. And there's just more and more after that. So so make sure you go check it out. And uh, I think with that, Ali, thank you again. Chat, thank you as always. Um, stay tuned. We're going to raid. And let's all go out there and do our best to, to help people up, not hold each other down. We'll see you next time.